The Watchers, Grigori, Nephilim, and Agigi have become common terms used nowadays on social media platforms, but they are rarely understood and just as often misappropriated. Most adherents of Abrahamic religions do not even broach this topic because it tends to expose the glaring inconsistencies and contradictions contained within their religious text. When we look at these specific terms, Watchers, Grigori, and Nephilim, there are basically a couple of perspectives in modern Judeo-Christian Islamic sects. There is the simple version and the significantly complicated one. This version is the one to which the vast majority of Western Judeo-Christians adhere. This simplistic view of the terms watchers and Nephilim is derived primarily from the King James Version translation of the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Ironically, the term watchers and the term Nephilim do not actually appear in these verses of the King James Version. So, where exactly do these terms originate? Well, that brings us very quickly to the complicated version. The complicated version is where we find scholars and theologians who have expanded beyond a relatively recent translation of a single book to other biblical translations and non-canonical texts to clarify these terms. According to these scholars, in the original Hebrew, the term mighty men in chapter 6 verse 4 of Genesis supposedly means Nephilim, which is derived from the Hebrew nafel, meaning to fall. In that sense, this race of hybrid giants, which were the result of unholy unions between divine sons of God, for example, angels, and mortal daughters of men, are better translated as the fallen ones. But the scholars are not even in agreement on that. While the giant Nephilim are barely mentioned in the Genesis narrative, they were the subject of great fascination in later apocalyptic literature, especially the Book of Enoch. In that text, which didn't make it into the Bible, a group of lusting angels conspire to sleep with human women, giving birth to a race of giants that spoil God's creation so completely that he has no choice but to send the floodwaters and wipe earth clean. Scholars say there are two possible reasons why the Genesis account of the Nephilim is so short. It's either a much longer story that got truncated in the text, or it was so common of a story that the authors of Genesis didn't bother to write down the whole thing. Across the ancient Near East and Mediterranean world, there were long-standing myths of gods falling in love or lust with human women and spawning godmen of superhuman size, strength, and power. In ancient Greek mythology, for example, Zeus fathered the hero Hercules from a tryst with the beautiful human Alcamini. Those demigod figures, well known to the ancient authors and readers of the Hebrew Bible, were the mighty men of old and men of renown referred to in Genesis. And this short text provides a passing explanation of how they came to be. According to scholars, the Nephilim were essentially superhuman because what they represent is something God never designed. They were a hybrid between beings that should have stayed in heaven and beings that should be on earth. 
The three-verse Genesis account of the Nephilim only hints at the notion that the unions between the sons of God and the daughters of men were a transgression. But, later Jewish writers ran with that idea and expanded the cast of characters to include a rebellious and sinful band of angels called the Watchers. In the text known as the Book of Enoch, likely written between 300 and 200 BCE, a group of 200 angels led by the angel Shimyaza hatch a plot to take wives from the beautiful and comely daughters of men. They know that what they're doing is a great sin, so they make a pact to follow through with it at all cost and suffer the consequences together. The rebellious angels are called the Watchers because their job as angels was to remain vigilant and watch over mankind. Later in the Book of Enoch, even the loyal angels are called Watchers, but the name is mostly associated with the bad guys. In the Book of Enoch, the Nephilim begat by the Watchers and human women aren't the heroic men of renown of Genesis, but great giants whose height was 3,000 eels, which is more than 3,000 meters tall. In their insatiable hunger, the monstrous Nephilim eat all of mankind's food, and when the food runs out, they start eating the men themselves. Not only do the Watchers bring these bloodthirsty giants into the world, but some of the fallen angels teach the women charms and enchantments, how to use roots and plants for sorcery, as well as how to make jewelry and makeup for the beautifying of the eyelids. To the men, the Watchers teach metallurgy and how to fashion swords and knives and shields and breastplates. And there arose much godlessness and mankind committed fornication, and they were led astray, and became corrupt in all their ways. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven, the book of Enoch says. It is only then that God intervenes and tells the angels to warn Noah of the coming flood, intended to heal the earth that the angels have corrupted. God further commands his loyal angels to destroy all the spirits of the reprobate and the children of the watchers, because they have wronged mankind. Destroy all wrong from the face of the earth and let every evil work come to an end. The Book of Jubilees gives another account of how the watchers fell that is similar to Enoch 1. It explains that the Watchers originally descended to the earth to teach mankind and do what is just, but they sinned with the daughters of men because these had begun to mix with earthly women so that they became defiled. Malalel named his son Jared because during his lifetime the angels of the Lord, who were called Watchers, descended to earth to teach mankind and to do what is just and upright upon the earth. Jubilees also says that they were sent by God himself. Against his angels whom he had sent to the earth, he was angry enough to uproot them from all their authority. Jubilees tells an account of the fall of the angels similar to that of Enoch 1. God was displeased with the angels because of their lust for the daughters of men. The union of the angels and women is said to be the Nephilim. For it was on account of these three things, fornication, uncleanness, and injustice, that the flood was on the earth, since due to fornication that the watchers had illicit intercourse, apart from the mandate of their authority, with women. When they married of them whomever they chose, they committed the first acts of uncleanness. They fathered as their sons the Nephilim. Who Enoch also mentions a group of angels called the Grigori, who are similar to the Watchers. Their prince is called Satanel. A difference in this account as compared with the two previous accounts is that only three angels came down to earth to take wives and beget giants. These are the Grigori, who with their prince Satanel rejected the Lord of Light and after them are those who are held in great darkness on the second heaven. And three of them went down on earth to the place Ermin, 
and broke through their vows on the shoulder of the hill Ermin, and saw the daughters of men how good they are, and took to themselves wives, and befouled the earth with their deeds, who in all times of their age made lawlessness and mixing, and giants are born. And therefore God judged them with great judgment, and they wept for their brethren, and they will be punished on the Lord's great day. The Book of Giants retells part of the Enoch story and elaborates on the exploits of the giants, especially the two children of Shimyaza, Oya and Haya. Since no complete manuscript exists of the Book of Giants, its exact contents and their order remain a matter of guesswork. The Book of Giants is a rather expansive narrative of the biblical story of the birth of giants in Genesis 6. In this story, the giants came into being when the Watchers, who God originally dispatched to Earth for the purpose of instructing and nurturing humanity, were seduced by and had sexual intercourse with human women, who then birthed a hybrid race of giants. These Watchers and giants engaged in destructive and grossly immoral actions which devastated humanity including the revealing of heaven's holy secrets or mysteries to their wives and children and to mankind generally. When Enoch heard of this, he was distressed and petitioned God, who in his long suffering and by divine revelation and counsel called Enoch to preach repentance unto them, that the earthly races might avoid God's wrath and destruction. In his mercy, God chose also to give the fallen watchers an additional chance to repent by transmitting dreams to several of their giant sons, including Oya and Haya, who relayed the dreams to an assembly of their Grigori and Nephilim companions. This assembly of watcher giant associates were perplexed by the dreams, so they sent a giant named Mawe to Enoch's abode and to the places of his preaching to petition him for the oracle. Enoch, in his attempt to intercede on their behalf, provided not only the oracle that the Watchers and Giants had requested, but also twin tablets that revealed the full meaning of their dreams and God's future judgment against them. When the Watchers and Giants had at last heard Heaven's response, many chose, in their transcendent pride and arrogance, rather than turn from their evil ways to act in defiance against God. A most fascinating aspect of the Book of Giants is that it affiliates the names of the Sumerian hero Gilgamesh and the monster Humbaba with the Watchers and Giants. Philo of Alexandria wrote a commentary of Genesis 6 called Concerning the Giants. In it, he emphasized that the passage was not a myth. And when the angels of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, they took unto themselves wives of all of them who they chose. Those beings, whom other philosophers call demons, Moses usually calls angels and they are souls hovering in the air. And let no one suppose that what is here stated is a fable, for it is necessarily true that the universe must be filled with living things in all its parts, since every one of its primary and elementary portions contains its appropriate animals and such as are consistent with its nature. The earth containing terrestrial animals, the sea and the rivers containing aquatic animals, and the fires such as are born in the fire, and the heaven containing the stars. For these also are entire souls pervading the universe, being unadulterated and divine inasmuch as they move in a circle, which is the kind of motion most akin to the mind, for every one of them is in the parent mind. It is therefore necessary that the air also should be full of living beings, and these beings are invisible to us inasmuch as their air itself is not visible to mortal sight. But it does not follow, because our sight is incapable of perceiving the forms of souls, 
that for that reason there are no souls in the air, but it follows of necessity that they must be comprehended by the mind, in order that like may be contemplated by like. As we can see, several ancient religious texts reference the Watchers slash Grigori and the Nephilim. The generalized storyline that can be distilled from all of these references is that some type of extraterrestrial beings sexually intermingled with humans, which resulted in some type of hybrid giant race. Regardless of adhering to a simple view or a complicated view, Folks in both groups tend to restrict their context to only these religious references. In essence, they are ensuring that no matter how simplified or complicated their understanding, it is nonetheless incomplete. Since we can trace the terms Watchers slash Grigori and Nephilim to the earliest text of the Abrahamic religions, why is it such a leap? to posit that these terms were likely derived from even earlier text, before the birth of those religions. With that question in mind, let's jump back about 5,000 years in history. In the early stellar cults of Mesopotamia, there were four royal stars, known as lords, that were called, you guessed it, the Watchers. Each one of these stars ruled over one of the four cardinal points common to astrology. This particular system dates from approximately 3000 BCE. The star Aldebaran, when it marked the vernal equinox, held the position of Watcher of the East. Regulus, marking the summer solstice, was Watcher of the South. Antares, marking the autumn equinox, was Watcher of the West, and Fomalhaut, marking the winter solstice was Watcher of the North. In the star myths, the Watchers themselves were depicted as gods who guarded the heavens and the earth. Their nature, as well as their rank, was altered by the successive lunar and solar cults that replaced the older stellar cults. Eventually, the Greeks reduced the Watchers to the gods of the four winds. Christian theologians, in their attempts to discredit pagan beliefs, joined the Watchers to an evil class of fallen angels known as the Principalities of the Air. St. Paul, in the New Testament, calls the fallen angels Principalities. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the Principalities, against the powers, against the spiritual host of wickedness in high places. It was also St. Paul who called Satan the prince of power of the air, and thus made the connection of Satan and etheric beings that were later known as demons and as principalities of the air. Once we understand that the Sumerian and Akkadian texts explaining our presence on earth are the source material for the Abrahamic religions that followed, we can analyze these events in a whole new light. As scholar Zachariah Sitchin so eloquently explains, what is little known even to scholars because the information is found in ignored text and has to be verified from complex god lists is the fact that it was Marduk who set the example that the sons of the gods followed. And it came to pass when the earthlings began to increase in number upon the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of the Elohim saw the daughters of the Adam that they were compatible, and they took unto themselves wives of whichever they chose. As we referenced earlier, the Bible clearly cites such intermarriage, the taking as wives, between young sons of the gods, which were the sons of the Elohim, the Nephilim, and female earthlings, which were the daughters of the Adam, as God's reason for seeking mankind's end by the deluge. The Sumerian and Akkadian texts explain that two gods were involved in that drama. It was Enlil who sought mankind's destruction by the deluge, while it was Enki who connived to prevent it by instructing Noah to build the salvaging ark. When we delve into the details, we find that Enlil's I've had it up to here anger on one hand, 
and Inky's counter-efforts, on the other hand, were not just a matter of principles. For it was Inky himself who began to copulate with female earthlings and have children by them, and it was Marduk, Inky's son, who led the way to and set the example for actual marriages with them. And it is when we look back at the Mesopotamian text referencing Marduk that we find the fourth term of our analysis, the Igigi. The term Igigi is first attested in texts from the Old Babylonian period and only occurs in Akkadian context. The Igigi indicates a group of gods in the Mesopotamian pantheon. It is, however, not entirely clear what distinguishes the Igigi from the Anuna, otherwise known as the Anunnaki. The story of Atrahasis, the Babylonian story of the flood and a precursor to the flood story in the Gilgamesh epic, offers some evidence on the relationship between the Anunnaki and the Igigi. The poem begins with the lines, When the gods, like men, bore the work and suffered the toil, the toil of the gods was great, the work was heavy, the distress was much. The composition continues. The seven great Anunnaki were making the Igigi suffer the work. What follows is partly fragmentary, but seems to indicate that the Igigi gods did not want to work anymore, and therefore the Anunnaki had to find a solution. Ultimately, this led to the creation of humans, who from then on had to bear the gods' work. In this story, it appears that the Igigi were subordinate to the Anunnaki. It is unclear which deities were included in the Igigi group, but in the prologue to the famous Code of Hammurabi, it is indicated that the Anunnaki elevated the god Marduk among the Igigi gods, but it is difficult to assess the significance of this passage. The Igigi are also mentioned in the Anzu myth, the Enuma Elish, and the Era poem. After decades of research and translation of these texts and many more, Sitchin was able to deduce a more detailed account of this group. By the time their mission Earth was fully operative, the Anunnaki stationed on Earth numbered 600. In addition, 300 Agigi, meaning those who observe and see, manned a planetary way station on Mars. And so it was, in the days before the deluge, that Marduk set an example to the young unespoused gods, find and marry an earthling female. The breach of the taboo appealed in particular to the Igigi gods who were away on Mars most of the time, with their principal station on Earth being the landing place in the Cedar Mountains. Finding an opportunity, perhaps an invitation to come and celebrate Marduk's wedding, they seized earthling females and carried them off as wives. As pointed out earlier, several extra-biblical books designated the Apocrypha, such as the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Noah, record the incident of the intermarriage by the Nephilim and fill in the details. In spite of their efforts to fit the Sumerian sources into a monotheistic framework, the compilers of the Hebrew Bible ended that section in chapter 6 of Genesis with a recognition of the factual outcome. Speaking of the offspring of those intermarriages, the Bible makes two admissions. The first, that the intermarrying took place in the days before the deluge and thereafter too, and secondly, that from the offspring came the heroes of old, the men of renown. The Sumerian texts indicate that post-diluvial heroic kings were indeed such demigods. But they were the offspring not only of Enki and his clan, but also kings in the Enlilite region who were sons of Enlilite gods. Concerning the four terms analyzed in this video, we can see their origin goes much further back before the religious text to which they are attributed. Many of our viewers would agree that the concept of religion, which was introduced millennia ago, has corrupted 
and handicap the current intellectual capacity of billions of humans on the planet today. There is a strong argument that in fact this corruption was quite intentional and resulted in the current debilitated mental state of humankind. Perhaps the most profound realization one can make when setting out on a journey of truth and revelation is the fact that our history did not begin, nor is it explained in any adequate form through the religious writings of another human. Nevertheless, literally billions of humans on earth today accept such a falsehood and never dig deeper. Of course, Many of our viewers consider such a proposition to be ludicrous, and the Archive is grateful to have you along in the exploration of our ancient past.